Yes. So uh, thank you so much for the few of you who were here for the last panel. I promise we will try and make it as uh, entertaining and as engaging as possible. So we we are going to talk about how can we improve the customer experience in a tech enabled world? How can we improve the customer experience in a tech enabled world? Now, all of us would have had some experience in the tech world where we are dealing with technology and, um, and we find that we're either talking to a bot or we're talking to someone who seems to be giving automated responses and it can be really, really frustrating, right? And a lot of times in this tech world, I've, I have personally wished that, you know, one could go back to the old world where there were a human being one could speak with, where there were just, where there was just good old, um, you know, face-to-face -face interactions. And, uh, and you could actually just, you know, build a relationship with the other person and do better business. I mean, there's a reason why for a lot of us, I'm sure, a lot of our parents still have bank accounts with Sarkari banks. And the reason why they still have bank accounts in Sarkari banks is precisely this reason that you can actually land up at the bank branch and have a conversation and get, get things going. And sometimes you find that, you know, with a lot of the new age banks, it's not that easy. They want to reduce footfalls in the bank branch. So with this, I want to start with uh, Jockey, Rishabh because we want to make sure that, like I said, I will promise you an engaging conference uh, session. Uh, so Rishabh is looking after Jockey and he's just transitioned from being the customer relations head to being the business head. Now we all know what Jockey is about, right? Jockey started with men's briefs, but of course today Jockey is in absolutely every segment of innerwear. Now, how would Jockey and why is customer experience in a tech world, why would it be relevant for a brand like Jockey? Why don't you tell us, Rishabh? Sure, sure. Just to correct two things. One is that uh, not just in aware, we have expanded to ah, all, we, are, we call ourselves as a comfort wear category now for all, all, all members of your family. And second, from a customer experience set to a business set, not relation, yeah. Customer relations, but it's fine. Yeah, so just to coming back to the question, I guess. Uh, see, we, we we have been talking about experience and I was just sharing backstage that experience for any consumer is uh, it starts from the point where he sees your advertisements over Google, Facebook or any other channel and it goes till the time he have not start using the product. So, which, which have like, if, if I break down this into multiple parts, uh, we have been seeing that, okay, you see an ad on a Google, how relevant is that ad for you? Uh, basis maybe your previous purchases or purchase history or whatever. And when you click on the ad, how do you land on the website? So in the D2C world specifically, tech being plays a very important role because starting from landing on the website starts with the page load time. How much time does it take for any website page to load? Uh, I think a uh, attention span which researchers say is, is two to three seconds is best. Even with the Google, they do not, uh, they, they don't rate you well if your loading time is more than three seconds. Uh, so that tick is the part which helps in reducing all that load time. Bring it to less than three seconds. Second, moving into the journey that, okay, if you have landed well, uh, how, how well your website shows about the product which, which comes up. And just to share from an example of Jockey, uh, there used to be a time we we know a common word. Okay, we all call innerwear as underwear, but as a brand uh, stands for, we have a common word name as innerwear on the whole website. Now, normally when you search on any website and you go and you type a specific word, it reaches. It's very basic that okay, it reads whatever the keywords are there on the page, and uh, it it reads that and show you that. We don't have underwear every, anywhere on the page. But one smart thing we had was that uh, you start typing U and D after the three characters, it will start showing you something or others, the suggestions from the page. Just guess that as a men, you go on the website, you have, some people know the answer here, but yeah, for the others, you go on the website, you start typing U and D, E, R and want to spell it underwear. What, what might be coming up? So before that, Rishabh, I want to ask you, 
uh, from your website analytics, do you have a sense of uh, what is the uh, male-female split that lands on jockey.com? Okay. As I said that uh, it serves all everyone. So, all our traffic-driven campaigns are equally spread over men's and men, male and female. But yes, organically, there's obviously a male authenticity because there's a bigger connect there, uh, uh, 27 years plus connect there. So, definitely right. that is a dominant. But Overall, it's 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 not far. Like it's like a 60-40 ratio, okay. or a 65. Okay. Uh, or sorry. Okay, sorry, 40, I digressed. Yeah. He had an interesting question. So, any guesses uh, to the audience? Like, if you are typing under U N D E R, what 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 did you get on the? What might you get on the website? You are looking for an underwear. I I see no hand, so I just answer that. We were showing under wired bras. And the basic logic, because we, we there was a smartness that okay, uh, whatever customer is looking, start showing it. So U and D are likha. So that the system read underwear was nowhere on the website. It was reading under wired from the under wired bra titles and was showing it. And it's completely useless. Now you complete typing underwear, you press enter, it will say no product found. Now how interesting that you are on a jockey website and you don't have an underwear. So that is what the customer experience. The, the, the customer who is doing that, it's, it's, it's just for a waste, it's got for a toss. And that's where the technology, like a lot of AI tools have come up. Now you do that same thing, it, it will be all sorted. Even we are intelligent enough to tell you, if you write a red brass, it shows you red colors only, nothing else. Uh, so that's how the technology changes the customer experience of uh, showing the right things what customer is looking for. And uh, similarly, when you move into the journey of uh, further, like let, let's say, let's talk about uh, when you are exploring any product and you finally add to cart and you want to check out. So payment dropouts is one of the major problem which, uh, which, which happened, uh, sorry, my bad, PG failures is most of the common problem which we, we used to see actually in a lot of websites used to happen. Now all the websites they have reduced the PG failures using tech only. How being that, okay, one particular partner of mine, let's say a razor pay gateway or something is, is not working or it's down at a particular time. We as a brand don't even know that and no one in the world, not even the customer knows that. Automatically there's tech who will see, okay, the failing rates of razor pay are growing across, uh, across the geography, across the brands and they will automatically switch it to an another payment gateway, let's say uh, Paytm gateway or any other. So because of the increase of technology in the space, overall end-to-end -end customer experience, which even the customer itself don't know, is increasing and making a base expectation for that customer. So yeah, that's that's all to start with. Fabulous, thank you so much for that, Rishabh. Nilima, would you like to take on um, anything? So Nil Nilima is with Luminous, and uh, firstly, it would be interesting to understand what part of your business would be, uh, would, would be D2C. And D2C apart, how does technology help improve customer experience? Thank you. Thank you, Vani. Uh, firstly, let me um, also let everyone know. So Luminous is a Schneider Group company. Schneider is a B2B company, while Luminous is 100% B2C company. So majority of the business is to the consumers, and this sells inverters, batteries, and solar. So now solar as a category and battery inverter, while people know it could be something which is just lying as a dumb unit, but with the technology, with the way consumer segments, everything has changed over the period of time, digital and technology is the way of doing business. It's no longer that you're enabling with a new tool or a new process, but it's the way of doing business. So at Luminous also we have inverters which can self-heal, which is about if you have a problem today, you don't need a customer service person to be available because of the battery management system, which is a complete algorithm, which people can sit centrally and diagnose the problem and heal it there just with a phone call. So now these are some things which is possible only because of technology. You and can heal a battery with a phone call? An inverter with a phone call, a battery okay. <laughs> with a phone call. Now that's where the battery management system is. We do have a product called Loom, Loom, uh, Loom Connect, which we call it for solar. So when you install a solar panel on your roof, ideally you as a consumer should know how much electricity did I produce, which can charge the complete room, number of appliances at home. So this app 
actually enables you to say how much is the consumption, how much is the usage of it, what appliances is consuming more and what appliances is consuming le less wow. electricity. If the weather is cloudy, how much do you need to conserve? So now these are some things which is possible because of technology uh, uh, in a category like this. The third thing which I, I also feel as a company we have done fabulously well is digitizing the channel partners. Now this is something which I, having worked in different industries and different companies, I still feel this is one of the best in the industry. It's, not be, it's beyond Salesforce what Salesforce used to do for channel. This is a partner app where there is more than one lakh partners onto this app. This app is mapped to the power backup system of power cut, which is happening in the country across. It, it is mapped to the pin code and districts at the Hetzil and Talukas level. Wow. So when there is a power cut, which is beyond, there are districts which has got 10 hours power cut, there are districts where there is four hours power cut. So this actually pushes the product within that ecosystem. It's a closed group ecosystem that which is the product which is far more favorable for you to sell in that area. And the logistics and supply chain pushes those products on priority from the inventory management point of view so that there is no gap in that. Now this is something which I say is fab when it comes to technology. So this, these are some few examples. There are many more like, for example, if you go today to Amazon and you want to buy an inverter, the knowledge is very less. Which one should you buy? If you have four ACs, if you have 20 lights, if you have five fans, if you have one big refrigerator, how much of consumption? And so which one should I buy? So here is the complete load calculator, which is available, which makes you actually which recommends and enables you to buy which one do you want to buy, right? And which one should you look at? And then comes the comparison with multiple brands, right? Mm. So these are some things which you can do just to enhance the customer experience, mm. immaterial of what your category is. Mm. Ideally, when the category comes home, you don't want to fit around. There is service partner available to service, install, do every demo which is required for it. But how is the experience to buy that product? How much digitized? And not just consumers, we forget the partners, we forget the channel, we forget the dealer which is recommending more in the multi-brand outlet. So these are the ways which I feel is how... These are beautiful examples, yeah. Nilima. Tell me, in these examples that you've talked about, and you just spoke about how a lot of it is to do with what you do prior, right? A lot of it is about knowing what the customer wants and then making that available for the customer. So tell me a little about, since you're the marketing head, tell me what role does consumer insights play over here? Like you would have done a lot of work to understand what are the kind of questions that people actually ask at the store, like how, I mean, you know, when you say we've got a load calculator, similarly for the other things that you talked about, like this bit about, oh, it's a cloudy day today. And so how much do I need to conserve? Talk to us a little about what do you do to gather consumer insights to be able to present what kind of solutions the company might need to present to the board. So I think advantage of the tech company is when you install or when you service a product, you get that data to actually analyze it better. Uh, consumer have to feed a lot of information to say what is the pro trouble which they're facing in the usage pattern. Uh, this, this year during IPL, we were doing a campaign, up cricket mein no power cut. Now it's very easy to say up cricket mein no power cut, but then there are while we are saying we are becoming energy surplus nation, but there is still a lot of the quality of uh, power cut which is there is still not equal across all districts of this country. So this is a time when we were going through all the data of what people are talking about, where are the higher power cuts and what are they thinking about when it comes to inverter. One data insight was wherever there is higher power cuts, they need a different solution and where there are lower power cuts, you need a different solution. So low KVA to mid KVA to high KVA, actually we did the complete digital programmatic campaign with that. The markets where there was higher power cuts, the market there was higher consumption, higher consumption because of more number of appliances. 
we had mapped with that and those are the places where it was showing up as high capacity inverters and the markets whereas otherwise because of programmatic now you can very well do all these things very easily very insight driven different creative different films different videos and different messaging landing to saying why we can say up cricket mein no park hai so this is just one example as to how you can use the insight the second best use of the insight is the new products and the innovation i think the new technology innovations which is going to come many we can't discuss today but all of them are built from how the brand is listening to what is happening to your product at home so we do have from lead acid to lithium to nickel to sodium to multiple alternate chemistries which chemistry is suitable to what kind of consumer need is something which will come basis the listening and what happens to the form what happens to the digital digital panel what happens to the control what happens to the home which is already automated how will you connect to a connected home versus a not connected home so those are some things which comes from all what you listen through consumer and data and insights very good so from healing batteries let's come to healing human beings so we've got with us uh, shamik from apollo and um, shamik is sitting with a lot of data because a lot of people are ordering medicines online and a lot of people are now becoming more comfortable with the idea of consulting with a doctor online um i think covid has made us a lot more comfortable consulting with a doctor online tell us shamik with all of that data that you have with you how do you use that data to make the customer experience more pleasant thank you you know uh, for a business like us which is a pro 24/7 where Uh, we had the advantage of a 40 year old best brand in the country in terms of healthcare we could spend all our time right in our team all our time just to figure out what we will do with this data right so what is most important is that it is not an add on to our daily business so apollo 247 is built with the focus that uh, we will create something where the distance between the consumer or the patient here and the healthcare provider is zero that's the only intent behind it because uh, what we believe is uh, you know 100 years back there was a big revolution happened where uh, it's called industrial revolution what happened is the problem of quantity was solved what we saw is that all the companies the east india companies of the world has called you know they they all went off and we had a new set of companies which is mostly on machines and industrialization 100 years from now 100 so then we had something called digitization what we saw all those companies which used to make so big is gone because every time this paradigm shifts what happens is the economy changes from to a classical economics where supply creates its own demand if you create a supply you will have a new market right so if you see all the companies which we have in this world at this point in time the big ones are all set up in the last 10 years 15 years where was google 25 years back right where was facebook where was all of us right Uh, to give an example uh, apollo as a company uh, i think uh, dr reddy uh, visualized this long back he was a visionary way back in 2005 he set up a company called health highway uh, basically the concept is uh, all medical reports i'll put on internet and globally doctors can see and consult people when they are chronically ill this is between doctors this is between so it's called health highway it was in 2004 Okay. but that time we used to get to internet to to landlines right you remember those days uh, i think it's way beyond way before time right uh, in 2009 he again tried once more okay. he created something called hap which is health app okay. uh, again he wanted to bring all the hospitals all the medicines everything at one place again way before time and i think the, he did not have the good developers to create he did not leave it then he again come came back in 2015 why i'm saying all these things is because when you want to derive information from data you need to have a clarity on your business objective what you are trying to do if you are not clear on what you are trying to do your data will remain a data it will never become information right what is important is the data guy should understand business and the business guy should understand data it cannot be two different offices that's where the challenge happens right 
uh, because no one respects each other. Everyone feels that we don't know anything. And that's where the problem happens. In our business, we set up 247 because we believed that if we can really create an infrastructure where we can understand data on a real-time basis, we will be able to make sure the customer experience journey is managed. We believe that customer is never happy, neither they are so, never sad. They go between the waves, right? So there'll be times when this medicine reaches into us, they'll be very happy. Next day, when you don't reach, you'll feel that it's the worst company in the world. You have to make sure that you know both. When it reaches to him in time, tell him that we tried and we, we succeeded this time. Next time when you fail, you have to make sure you tell him that I'll take care of you. Don't worry. I am sorry. I'll do it. Right? And as a company, what we do is we constantly make sure internally we put feedback to the team to make them better and better. That's what we do as a company. We just make sure all data are captured, they put into a funnel, put information, and team who can make a difference is given the feedback. As simple as that. All we do is capture them, put them on a funnel, and give feedback. Because we don't have anything to sell, right? We are just a platform. We are technology, and all 800 of us uh, do nothing but think about how to use it. Okay, that's fabulous. Since you talked about using real-time data, Shamik, would you be able to talk to us about a few examples of how would, because you're sitting with millions of points of data, right? Now, at the end of the day, if I have ordered medicines on Apollo, I don't care about the other millions of data that you have. What I want to know is when is my medicine arriving? If I, my medicine hasn't arrived on time, then I happen to know you, I might want to give you a call. But uh, what? how would you, as Shamik of Apollo, what, what would you and your department do to improve the customer experience of that one disgruntled of that one disgruntled customer? Or what would you do to track data real time and make some corrections midway? You know what my uh, ops guy did in Gurgaon. So, you know, last, uh, you know, about, about a month back, every time I ordered, my packet came with a silver strip. So I was not sure what was happening. And every time I ordered, within 20 minutes, my order was delivered and it came with a silver strip. So that's one way to do it, yeah. right? Yeah. Right? But uh, that doesn't work all the way because we are not here for uh, we have that you know we have to make sure. So what we so let's me take a very interesting example. And I was it's about three days or four days back. Uh, <coughs> we are trying to have a very heavy push to grow, and uh, we were we you know we in our company we have about approximately 250 to 300 sort of different customer cohorts on any given day. And these cohorts are, are made with different variables, like where do you stay, what's your age, what's your family structure, what have you bought in the past, how you look in the morning, a lot of those variables, right? And those variables define a sort of a customer segment. And we have about 250 to 600, 300 customer segment. Few customer segments are very important for us. For example, a guy staying in Gurgaon having a cardiac problem at home. Wow. Next 10 years, you'll buy medicine from us, right? So we don't want to make sure anything goes wrong. So we have those flags and make sure that we keep a very close track. Three days before back, uh, all of a sudden, from 10 o'clock in the morning till about 11.30, we realized that uh, where this, this type of people used to buy medicines for about 940 rupees every order, that came down to 850, which is about 90 rupees difference. And we saw that over a consistently for a segment of people for about an hour or so, right? What did we do? We clearly figured out that there's another flag of data saying that cardiac medicines from this store or this go down is out of stock. That means something which went out of stock did not go back to the supply chain and it did not get feedback because I can't keep a lot of stock. I have to also make sure my economies works, right? So that small bug was actually showing some medicines out of stock. Now what happened? I lost business, but my customers got irritated because this time they could not get all the medicines, right? They will go back to my competition. So what do we do? Now that's what I said, customers are never happy or never sad. This is the point where the customer is feeling bad. Now how do we make sure that data and the information brings them back to the you know, positive space? What we do is, it's about 1,000 customers. We can clearly say that, hey, you are looking for this medicine. I have packed it, sending it to your home. Don't worry. It doesn't make too much sense because I know these people. They are on my app. They already bought. 
they are transacting customers, I can quickly put them back onto the thing. When they get it back at home, right, and they all stay at Icon and us, so it's 10 minutes for us, we just do a round. Once they get it, they again get back to the positive zone. So customer experience is not about a good or bad, it's a journey, it's a wave. You have to manage it as a company and what can help is uh, your intent, your business objective, your data and information. That's what we believe and that's what we are trying to do. And just to add to that, I think the question which was like on time, on the uh, uh, the experience which we talk about is the most interesting today in the post order. So rather in fact in my own team I have now, uh, I just changed the mic I guess so you can increase the volume. Yeah, so uh, in my own team, what I've done also there is that I've made two types of uh, sub teams. One is looking the experience from uh, person landed on the website to order. Mm -hmm. Another is from order to delivery. Mm -hmm. And why this is because if I ask any one of you here, we spend like 30 minutes or one hour on, on, on the website or anywhere on an app to make an order. But the most of the time of this experience is spent after that. Okay, we have to wait for 24 hours or 48 hours or for that, let's say 4 hours a slotted delivery or anything. So that's the most important area where companies, uh, most of the companies are trying to capture the space and create an enhanced customer experience. Technology coming in place like companies like Farai, they will tell the customer once the packet is dispatched, when exactly is it arriving you? So maybe two or three minutes up and down, but you know the exact time by, the, uh, by when it is, uh, it is arriving at your doorstep. And we plan for it. Uh, technology is asking if you have done a cash on delivery, uh, communicating to you between that uh, journey and trying to make it a prepaid order. Mm -hmm. Technologies are there to uh, send you a WhatsApp between that, tell you the status that okay, it's in a packed state or it is ready to ship and just not keep the gap open and make a customer call the customer care to ask where is my order, rather be uh, proactive in telling them what's happening with their order. Mm. So that's how technology helps. No, this is very helpful. But taking on from what you just spoke about, Risha, I think this one is also a little bit of a double-edged um, sword in the sense that as a customer, you also don't want to be bombarded with notifications where you're accustomed to ordering online. You don't want to constantly know, oh, now your package has reached such and such point and now your package is on the way and now it has reached this point and oh you'll get your package tomorrow. Sometimes I find that it's also an overdose of notifications you know and um, so it's a it's it's a balance between you know sort of over informing the customer and this is a time where a lot of us are used to uh, thanks to Amazon a lot of us are used to ordering a lot of stuff online. And you don't want to be constantly bombarded with the last thing I want where there's already a very, very cluttered WhatsApp, yet another WhatsApp notification on, oh, now your package has reached here and now it's reached here. And oh, uh, you know, you're going to be getting it tomorrow. I'm like, just give it to me, man. You, I don't want the, those many. So um, I don't know what is the right answer to that. No, no, it's very important, actually. Uh, that, that point is very important because uh, just add one more thing to this. Uh, first answering it out, what happened is that it's very important how you do it. Huh. Don't bombard it on every channel. You know the customer number, send him an SMS, send him a WhatsApp, send him a notification, do everything for him. Obviously, it will be too much to consume. Uh, more important is that maybe you make your uh, the application that way that at least if we want to know kahan yaar, kahan gaya, let's say, what will he do? He will open the app to call customer care. But before he do that, he first thing you see in the order journey is the complete status of the order. That's yeah. how we see it on Amazon yeah. and all. They don't send you, don't, they will not bombard you. Uh, secondly, in fact, uh, just to adding that uh, I, was, I was there in another conference with the uh, Sai who heads the WhatsApp for Meta. We were discussing on the same line. I had a cross question there that yeah, Meta has increased the price for WhatsApp delivery. And it's very disappointing. I was like, Guys, this is the best thing which have happened. Otherwise, it was so cheap and we were we were starting doing promotion. All the brands, including Jockey, we might be thinking in the line, send promotional messages. And it will again become a uh, SMS for you. For for end consumer, it will begin a, again an SMS channel. Sure, Meta which you don't you. open. Yeah, obviously. And that was the reason that they are looking into the price increase for promotional only. Not for the utility or the service message. So, yeah, but I guess there. an underwear I can still wait for. 
but uh, medicines. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, for in a in a way, I can wait. <laughs> so maybe, or, yeah, for an, yeah. for, or for inverter, I will not wait because <laughs> I need it immediately. <laughs> but, but the cricket match is on. You have to get there, no? But just to lighten the mood, Rishab, tell me, do you find impatient customers even with Innova? I know one of the customer whom we lost because we didn't deliver in three hours. Okay. <laughs> So that's, uh, and how do I know it? Because uh, that's husband of my team member. She told me uh, he ordered from XYZ because uh, he was not getting a three-hour delivery. Uh, not a good appraisal for her. <laughs> that's, that's a separate story. But yeah, uh, and given the fact that we have employee discount, by the way. We, we, know, we, are, we are not no discounting brand, but we still have employee discount. We still because of three, three hours delivery, he moved to another brand. So it, it, it's more about the generation we are talking about. I think we are all already sitting here who think that uh, end delivery is not important. But if we talk about generation, gen, uh, the Gen Z, for them, uh, they, are, they are born in the world of Zepto and Blinkit. For them, uh, 10 minutes delivery is a normal expectation. That, that's what they expect from you. 10 yeah. minutes, 30 minutes or a 4 hour delivery. You tell them we deliver in two days, it's an enough area. What's the matter? It's not, it's, it, the job is not done. Because the Gen Z is an unplanned generation. They do not plan for a trip and, uh, and, and for, uh, a week back they have packed their whole bag and sitting like, I'm going to trip and go to Goa. Goa is going to go to pack and they realize, okay, I don't have to go to Bermuda. Hai. Whatever, like, uh, so whatever you need for there, you don't have it and you need it now. You can't wait for 24 so hours. you don't get it on Blinkit. Sorry? You don't get your stuff on Blinkit. It's come upcoming on Blinkit yeah, also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, who would no, think? It's, it's, it's upcoming we, on Blinkit. We now, we now need chaddis also on Blinkit. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Coming to you, Priyanka. Talking about proximity to, uh, you know, to point of purchase. You're in the business of uh, consumer appliances. Tell us in the world of consumer appliances where I would imagine. I mean, if I have to buy a fridge. I would want to go to the store and I would want to check out the fridge. What is the role that technology would play in customer experience? Thanks, Rani. That's a brilliant question. Uh, in fact, before I start with that, I'd like to say that, you know, uh, for us at Hire, there are three pillars that we are heavily concentrating on when it comes to digitalization. It is employees, it is consumers, and it is our partners. So only when these three wheels are working together is when we can truly enable a technology world for our consumers, right? So coming back to the question that you asked me, interestingly, we did a, recently we did a campaign where we did hyper-local targeting. So what hyper-local targeting means is that if you are a consumer and if you are in sector 29 and you're going to widget sales, you know, there are high chances when I can trigger my brand in your mind when you are in that lane. So the last mile connectivity becomes a very, very, important part in the consumer acquisition stage. So that is one of the campaigns that we did. So like this, there are many other things that we are exploring from the brand perspective. Tell me something. Uh, once I've bought a fridge, then I'm either happy with it or I'm not so happy with it. You would want that the next fridge I buy, whenever I do buy the next fridge, I, you know, you would want that it be the, the your brand yet again. How would you manage the customer experience or what the customer, um, you know, even through the servicing and whatever be the sentiment around your product, how would you manage that once the product has been sold to the customer? So there comes our after sales service into picture. So what happens typically is in India, for in India, typically what happens is that, you know, the refrigerators for that matter, there are so many features, even refrigerators, televisions, air conditioners, there are so many features in these electronic items or appliances where consumers are not aware about them. They are using these appliances, <clears throat> but they do not know the kind of features that are available. So there we are strengthening our after sales team. So we've put this team, the task force team, where they are going to the existing customers who bought our appliances and electronics to train them 
you know, madam, you bought our refrigerator. Maybe you are using X Y Z feature, but there are these other features in the refrigerator which can help you, which can give you the convenience that you're looking for, which can give the ROI for the product. You bought like a sixty thousand, seventy thousand side by side refrigerator, but you're not using it to the utmost capacity or the potential the product has. So how do you educate the customers? Is the responsibility of the brand equally? It's not that you. you've sold the product and your job is over there that's when the after sales comes into picture and after sales is evolving major time it is no longer just servicing the product but it is about educating your customer also on a lot of attributes that the customer might not be aware about that's when you again there is a connection that you build with the customer that hey a service guy came to me it's not that he only did the service but he brought something to the surface for me which i was not expecting so that's when customer delight comes into picture that's when the brand empathy also comes into picture and that's when the brand elevates with the customer service very well spoken tell me something priyanka in um, in all of the data that you might track and uh, this might be data from offline channels is there a way of you also tracking what percentage of your sales come from repeat customers absolutely we for, do but for appliances yes. i mean one would imagine for appliances because these are very very high value products your repeats would matter to you a lot more than let's say a 5 rupee packet of chips absolutely it does in fact a recent report of bain says that you know 5% customer retention is equivalent to a 25% to 95% growth in your business so we are heavily focusing on that in fact to your point uh vani what we are heavily doing yes we are focusing on that but what we are heavily doing is understanding the indian consumer and the needs which is on the basis of usage of a certain product which is again the data that is being provided to us so clear example is bottom mount refrigerator which was an alien concept in india market hire was the company to introduce that concept to india market it's a world leading brand in bottom mounted refrigerators and india's leading brand as well so what we understood was that a lot of time the freezer section is not being used so bending can be reduced if you place the freezer downwards so bottom mount refrigerator is a clear cut example of understanding the consumer so like i say that higher believes in customer inspired innovations so customer inspired innovations is basis the usage the patterns the behavior the expectation of the consumer from a certain product so this is what we have done the other example is the air conditioners with the self clean technology higher only is the only brand that has that self clean technology so we are heavily reliant on the service people to come and clean our uh, air conditioner at the time of summers right every year we do this practice but with higher air conditioners at just a press of your remote you can switch on the self clean mode and in 21 minutes the entire unit gets cleaned without any spill of water in the room nothing of that sort it's an internal inbuilt system how have we arrived you know at this technology is by understanding the pain point of the consumer it's a hassle calling the service guy sometimes the service guy does not come madam do din mein aaunga teen din mein aaunga aayega to then the service is not very satisfactory and then the whole lot of tam jam which you see in the house is another hassle to deal with so if you have an appliance like that which is that smart and can deal with your pain points in in that smart and efficient way what else the consumer wants so data is helping us become better is helping us serve our consumers better we have 5 minutes left is there anyone from the audience who would like to ask a question to any of the panelists just to check if you're all listening <laughs> anyone any one of you is there any additional uh, point you'd like to make i would like to say something uh, the the health and quality of business is a lot on doing repeat business it's about acquiring customers for the lifetime so this lifetime value and what do you need to do around it is a lot dependent on how tech enabled and how digitized the business is and that's where the insight the data the analytics everything comes with that 
Um, so it's very critical in a tech-enabled world, while we say it's a tech-enabled world, but also to understand the consumer cohorts. Um, a, a digital native consumer versus, say, my parents who are not digital natives, but they have a certain different need from the customer experience. Uh, now these two are two different cohorts and within that there are many more cohorts like what Shamik talked about is more than 200 cohorts but then every business has their own set of many such cohorts to understand the behavior. I think the key which we didn't touch upon today is the hyper personalization and digitization which we talked about. So digitization is one but personalization making it relevant and then innovation. Without that, the journey is not complete. So digitization to personalization and then to innovation and then coming, and sorry, in between is data driven. So these four is the matrix, which I would say is very, very critical when it comes to a tech enabled world for having a real customer experience journey. Absolutely. And with that, since you talked about uh, personalization, the other thing that came to my mind which um, is very critical in today's uh, technology world, uh, especially post COVID, we find that a lot of brands have gone online, online brands have gone offline. One of the things that we forget about in the context of co consumer experience is that in today's world, it is incumbent on the brand to make sure that the customer experience is exactly consistent both in the online world and the offline world. If I've experienced, uh, you know, if I have a certain impression, if I have certain expectations of the brand in the offline world, then I would expect exactly the same online and vice versa. And the other important point that you touched upon and actually all of the panelists spoke about was the importance of deriving insights and how those insights convert into real actionables, whether it's in the form of innovation or it's in the form of figuring out that even if I'm typing kacha, like you said, on jockey, I'm still able to see jockey in a way which doesn't use words that are vernacular or doesn't use even the word underwear on their website. So in with fact, that, uh, to your point, yeah. I'd like to add to that. When you said that, you know, uh, that seamless experience of online versus offline, mm -hmm. you know, it is becoming utmost crucial for every brand to have these days. I'll, I'll tell you a clear example of consumer durable. Even though online sales do not contribute much to consumer durables, but what happens essentially is the kind of experience I'm offering at online is an image builder yeah. for the brand. So if on Amazon and Flipkart, I'm not representing the brand nicely, there is a certain perception that I'm forming about the brand. And what happens eventually eventually is that it is Amazon is like another Google search platform for you these days. So you go there, you search, but ultimately you go to the retail format to buy the product. Because like a side-by-side -side refrigerator, until you touch and feel the product, you would not buy that online, right? The chances are lesser there. But you will definitely go on Amazon and Flipkart to evaluate, compare, research about the product. So it becomes equally important for me to be well represented on Amazon and Flipkart, even though my sales are not contributing too much there. Not just well represented, but like she said, because a lot of our research for appliances, I mean, I'm sure for all of us sitting in this room, whether it's an appliance or a car or any high involvement product, we'd certainly research, we'd compare, we'd check features, we'd look at price discounts, we do all of that online. And over there, like you mentioned, the impression that the brand makes on me is what determines what showroom I walk into. So with that, thank you so much for being an actively listening audience. I hope you were actively listening, even if you didn't participate, but we've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. <laughs>